All right. Good morning to all of you joining us from Malaysia. And hello to those who are joining us from everywhere else in the world. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this edition of the Hydrogen Dialogue series titled Hydrogen 101, the techno-economics of hydrogen as a fuel, a Canadian perspective. This event is jointly organized by the Malaysian Oil and Gas Services Council, Alternative Energy Working Group, and the High Commission of Canada in Malaysia. My name is Mohan Gurusami. I'm a Trade Commissioner at the High Commission of Canada, as well as the Vice Chair of the MOXIE Alternative Energy Working Group. And I have the pleasure of being your host this morning. Through this session today, we will try to address two questions. Why Canada and why hydrogen? The partnership between Canada and Malaysia in the energy sector is more than 100 years old. Oil was first discovered in Malaysia in 1910 in a location in Sarawak that is today called Canada Hill. It was so named after two Canadian engineers working for Royal Dutch Shell who made the discovery. In recent years, those of you who are familiar with Talisman Energy may know that it was originally a Canadian company when Talisman first began exploration and production in Malaysia. And today, Malaysia's national energy company Petronas owns and operates one of the largest natural gas reserves in Canada. So as both Canada and Malaysia seek to transition from fossil fuels towards a low carbon energy future, there's more opportunity for us to partner and learn from each other. As for the second question of why hydrogen, we have today one of Canada's leading experts on the subject to walk us through some of the first principles of using hydrogen as a fuel. Now, before we proceed into this webinar, I would like to go over some housekeeping rules. We ask that all attendees kindly turn off your video and mute your microphones to minimize distractions. If you have questions for our speaker today, Dr. David Lazelle, please feel free to type them into the chat box or save your questions for the Q&A session. We will be monitoring questions and we will do our best to try and answer as many of your questions as time permits during the Q&A session, right? So since this is an, an oil and gas event, uh, typically we start off with a safety briefing, but since we're doing this virtually, uh, we have a safety moment PSA. So let's go to the video, Raimi. Did you know you all spend around one third of your life sleeping, and yet most of us know very little about it? Like food and water, sleep is a biological necessity, a sort of fuel that the body needs to function properly. Our prehistoric ancestors would go to sleep when the sun went down and wake up at sunrise. The nine to ten hours of sleep they had each night allowed them to function at peak performance so they could hunt, protect themselves and survive. For thousands of years, this would be the human sleep routine until around 1880, when an event happened that revolutionized our sleeping habits forever. The invention of the electric light bulb. Ever since that moment, we've gradually reduced the amount of sleep we should be getting in order to stay fit, alert and healthy. If you spent last night tossing and turning, you're not alone. In today's fast paced world, more and more of us aren't getting enough sleep. If you do shift work, work unsociable hours, have young children, run a hectic social life, or are simply feeling ill with cold or flu, then you might only be getting four or five hours sleep each night. Nearly 50% less than you actually need. You might think, so what? I can get by on only a small amount of sleep and still feel fine. Or you might say to yourself, I can do without sleep because I can make it up another time. The problem with both of these statements is that an irregular sleeping pattern can have profound consequences on our health. The symptoms can range from the minor, such as reduced alertness, to serious health conditions like heart disease and can even result in death. At all because we're simply not getting enough sleep. This course is designed to wake you up to the importance of sleep. So, before you nod off, let's get started. That's right, it's an important PSA, do get enough sleep, right? <laughs> to start off today's webinar, it gives me great pleasure to invite the president of the Malaysian Oil and Gas Services Council and the mentor to the Alternative Energy Working Group, technologist Wan Sharifah Zaida Norlisha, to say a few words. Wan Sharifah, over to you. Let me just... Thank you, Mohan. Um, definitely now I'm going to go back, I'm going to go to sleep early tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Dr. David Lazel, Energy Systems Architect, 
the transition accelerator. Mr. Ryan Bay, Senior Trade Commissioner, High Commission Canada in Malaysia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning to all MOXIE members and attendees to the second webinar in the Hydrogen Dialogue series. Two weeks ago, on the 11th of August this year, we had the first session of the Hydrogen Dialogue series with Adlan Ahmad, head of Hydrogen Unit in Petronas. And as a continuation of that webinar, the MOXIE Alternative Energy Working Group, in collaboration with the High Commission of Canada in Malaysia, is pleased to have with us today Dr. David Lazel. Moxie is glad to work with the High Commission of Canada to bring you this installment of the Hydrogen Dialogue series, and this promises to be an engaging discussion. Moxie, through the Alternative Energy Working Group, aims to support the oil and gas energy's transition to the new energy future. And in this regard, we are setting our sights globally to identify best practices and partnerships opportunities. Canada and Malaysia have a long-standing partnership in the energy industry. And as mentioned by Mohan just now, not too long ago, Talisman Energy was a major presence in the development of Malaysia's oil field resources. And in Canada today, Petronas is one of the largest natural gas players, and they're now looking at further investments in the blue hydrogen. And Canada, similar to Malaysia, is rich in oil and gas resources and is leading the way towards net zero emissions by 2050. Through dialogues such as these, there is much that we can learn from each other and work together towards a low carbon energy future. Now, do join the MOXIE Alternative Energy Working Group or join our next working group meeting if you're interested in ha having this awareness and this information. We will email a meeting notice when the next meeting is planned. And if you're not on our email list, do let the Secretariat know and we can add you into our email database. And for those who are not yet MOXIE members, come and hi I highly encourage your company to join MOXIE as a member. There is wealth of information that you know and we are going into uncharted waters here and you know change is a constant and we really are really uh, path, um, making our way our path to the to the uh, low energy future low carbon future again get in touch with the secretary on how to register as a member do also follow Moxie's social media accounts as latest information are also regularly shared in our LinkedIn Facebook Instagram accounts other than our normal website now, I would like to thank Dr. David Lazo for sharing his expertise with us today and to our friends at the High Commission of Canada for their continued partnership. Thank you to the Alternative Working Group, uh, group led by Chairman Amran and Vice Chair Mohan and their team for putting this together. The energy that the, these two and their team have to raise the industry awareness is fantastic. And thank you to the Secretary led by Rohazli and team for ensuring everything that we do in MOXIE is smooth. Thank you to all of you for this attack for your attendance and I hope that you will find that this today will be a stimulating conversation. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Back Thank to you, you Mohan. Thank you very much for Sharifa for that opening keynote. Well, in, in December of last year, the government of Canada published its hydrogen strategy for Canada. In this document, Canada envisions that 30% of its end-use energy will be delivered through hydrogen by the year 2050. Dr. David Lazelle and his team at the Transition Accelerator have collaborated closely with the government in developing this strategy. Dr. Lazelle is one of the founders and he's the energy systems architect at the Transition Accelerator. He's also professor and director at the CESAR Research Initiative at the University of Calgary. Speaking with us today about the techno-economics of hydrogen as a fuel, it gives me great pleasure in welcoming Dr. David Lazelle. Dave, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mohan, and uh, th thanks for this opportunity to talk to everybody today. I will begin by sharing my, my slides here, my charts, and uh, hopefully we'll get started. Um, if uh, um, So what I'm going to do is, is talk a bit about um, a little start by a discussion about why uh, we're looking at hydrogen and, and about the transition accelerator. The, the transition accelerator is set up uh, about two years ago uh, to really move towards how, figuring out how Canada can win 
in this transition to net zero energy systems. As me, most of you know, I believe uh, Canada is one of uh, one of many countries in the world, more more than 50 or 60 right now, that have uh, committed to the transition to a net zero energy systems by 2050. So what we've been looking at is how Canada can win in this trans transition and what are the best transition pathways. If you look at our existing energy system in Canada, it can be uh, seen as uh, the diagram on the left here, where a lot of our emissions are associated, the majority of our emissions are associated with the end use demand, the consumption or basically combustion of energy, carbon carrying energy carriers, carbon fuels, if you like, uh, that are when combusted lead to a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. There are also a lot of emissions associated with producing those fuels. And so as, as people around the world and researchers around the world and, uh, and, and um, industry looks at what a net zero energy system will look like, it's pretty clear that we've got to replace many of these energy carriers we use today. Doesn't mean we can't still use fossil fuels, but we can't release them uh, in distributed locations out of the tailpipes of cars, et cetera, uh, so that they are just going into the atmosphere. We have to capture the carbon from our fossil fuels and sequester it through carbon capture and storage. And we have to convert our energy carriers, the carriers that bring us the energy we need in, in our various homes and businesses and in our vehicles uh, through uh, energy carriers like electricity or perhaps hydrogen. There is a role for biomass as an energy carrier because, of course, when the trees and plants grow, they pull carbon out of the atmosphere and, um, and therefore when we combust them, we're completing the carbon cycle. But the capacity of biomass to provide Canada or even the world with whole world with energy is is highly limited. So what we've been very interested in is the role of hydrogen as an energy carrier, uh, expanding its current role that it plays within uh, our energy system. And why hydrogen? Well, some sectors uh, need chemical, not electrical energy carriers. And some of the, these are air sectors like freight transportation or heavy industry or space heating in countries like Canada, where we have very cold climates and large buildings that uh, there's using electricity would just uh, disrupt our, our electrical grid too much. There'd be too much energy demand in one season of the year that, to make it economically viable. So the other thing is that a, a hydrogen is not really a competition to electricity. It's kind of a partner where electricity and hydrogen can be converted uh, from one into another through basically fuel cells. And if you want to go from hydrogen to electricity through electrolyzers, if you want to go from electricity to hydrogen. And, and hydrogen can be a way of actually long-term storage of electricity. And hydrogen is also valuable in enhancing biomass conversion to biofuels. It can actually add the extra energy into the biomass uh, to, to increase the, um, the uh, efficiency of biomass carbon conversion <clears throat> to biofuels. So what we've been looking at within Canada is we are already have a pretty significant hydrogen economy today. Uh, we've estimated about 8,200 tons of hydrogen per day are produced. The vast majority of it is produced from fossil fuels, mostly natural gas, uh, through steam methane reforming of natural gas into hydrogen. Carbon dioxide is released to the atmosphere uh, and that hydrogen is used to make fertilizers for agriculture. Ammonia is one of those uh, fertilizers, but best known, of course, and uh, fuels for transportation. In Alberta, we use hydrogen to crack bitumen, the heavy oil, if you like, into a, uh, a, a lighter oil, uh, to a synthetic crude oil, and also for converting all kinds of crude oil into uh, fuels like gasoline and diesel, etc. And it's used in the making of materials and chemicals. As we look to the future in a net zero energy system, we look to provide, um, make hydrogen in a slightly different way. We can still use fossil fuels or we can use biomass, but instead of releasing the CO2 to the atmosphere, uh, it needs to be made in a way to, where the CO2 can be captured and geologically sequestered or otherwise used. We also are looking at plants, uh, chemical plants like chloralkali plants where you make sodium hydroxide where hydrogen is a byproduct of the process. And uh, there's not a lot of demand for that hydrogen where in these chloralkali plants. So it's often vented 
we can actually maybe take byproduct hydrogen and feed it into an energy system. And of course, we can make hydrogen from uh, clean electricity, from renewables or nuclear electricity, low carbon electricity, and you can make the hydrogen by splitting water through electrolysis. The hydrogen would not only be used as an industrial feedstock, but as a fuel for transportation, buildings, industry, and power, and even for export. Uh, the Canadian, our estimate in working with the federal government and various other researchers, that the domestic market for hydrogen is around $50 billion per year within Canada, and another export market perhaps worth another $50 billion a year uh, by mid-century. So this is potentially a very significant uh, a market. And when I'm talking dollars here, I'm afraid I'm talking Canadian dollars. Um, a Canadian dollars, if you multiply my numbers by 0 0.8, you'll get pretty close to what American dollar would be. So all the numbers I have are about 30% uh, higher than uh, 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 American dollar. Um, Canada is known to be among the world's lowest cost producers of both blue and green hydrogen. Uh, and this is from a Japanese study, a reference to it is here. I'll make these charts available to everybody at the end of my presentation. But there's this Japanese study in 2018 looked at all the countries uh, on the Pacific Rim countries and looked at what the cost, what was their uh, cost for making low carbon hydrogen. And as you can see here, Canada is amongst the lowest in uh, the Pacific Rim countries and uh, can make hydrogen at about $10 per gigajoule. And that's with carbon capture and storage included. Uh, our current, the current price is uh, quite a bit less than that. It's uh, you know, almost about 60% of that or so. Um, we can also, we're also a very low cost producer of green hydrogen, but it's quite a bit more expensive than blue hydrogen today. And you notice that the hydrogen, the price that we can make hydrogen for is about half the wholesale cost of diesel in Canada. Uh, it's about $20 a gigajoule of her diesel. That comes in at about 70 cents or so a, a liter, uh, and it's about one third the retail cost. So this opens up an, quite an interesting opportunity. If we could make hydrogen um, at, a, at $10 and look at targeting markets for transportation fuels, especially for heavy vehicles, heavy trucks, uh, there's perhaps enough, uh, enough space between here if it's done efficiently, sufficiently uh, efficient that that we could actually make this work and create a economically vibrant economy uh, with a, a lot of public subsidy required. <clears throat> so one of the questions is what markets for hydrogen are most promising? Now the chart I just showed you before showed the chart for wholesale and retail cost of transportation fuels and they're up in the range of gain around 30 odd dollars per gigajoule around uh, you know 15 to 20 dollars per gigajoule uh, for wholesale costs. And um, what we have for natural gas is uh, the wholesale cost for natural gas in, in a Canada and Alberta is on Alberta, it's way down here. We have very inexpensive in Alberta. In some parts of Canada, like Eastern Canada, uh, it can be up to around nine or $10. And the retail cost is of course higher than that. So when you look at this and you say, well, <clears throat> what's the price of making blue hydrogen and the price of making green hydrogen? I think it's pretty clear that um, if this is the cost for making the gases, the tr in a transition to a net zero hydrogen economy, transportation, especially freight transportation, heavy duty transportation that uses diesel uh, holds the most promise for economically viable uh, uh, energy system in the, in the short to medium term. For smaller vehicles like uh, personally owned vehicles that don't drive very far, <clears throat> our analysis analysis of others suggests that battery electric vehicles are probably a much better option and much more economically viable. But for reasons of requiring um, uh, very long distances, very heavy loads, uh, and also the wanting to be able to use vehicles for 18, 20 odd hours a day, uh, those systems really require rapid refueling and uh, um, an ability to hold a lot of energy on board. But, you know, so we could argue that maybe hydrogen doesn't look very good for natural gas heat, for space heating, for example, or for some industrial heat systems. But when you actually look at what the options are for, for natural gas for heat sources in a net zero low carbon future, uh, it's, uh, you'll see that hydrogen is probably one of the most attractive. It's certainly going to be more expensive than just natural gas today but uh, it is probably the only alternatives we have 
if you can't, if you use electricity, electricity prices are typically off scale here on this chart, if you were looking at the price of electricity. So hydrogen is probably going to be more important in the future. It just may not transition to as a heating fuel in the in the next five or 10 years. Uh, and But I think society is going to have to get used to in the movement to a net zero uh, future of paying more for, for heating fuels than we pay for today, especially in Canada. Now, what I'd like to do is walk through here some of the value chains that we see as being really important within a Canadian context. We start here on the left side of this chart with production. So we can have the green uh, symbols here represent different sources of electricity, low carbon power through an electrolyzer, it takes water to make hydrogen. And on the bottom, we have the blue hydrogen production using natural gas, biomass, oil, for example, or even coal. Uh, with water again, you can be gasified and resorbed to produce hydrogen and CO2 and the CO2 sequestered, so we don't contribute to greenhouse gases. Um, one of the things for using for this hydrogen is we can take this hydrogen and put it into a hydrogen pipeline and blend it into our natural gas distribution network. This is already being done. It's going to be tested in uh, Fort Saskatchewan uh, in near Edmonton in, in Alberta within the next uh, six months or 12 months. It's being tested already in other places in Europe and around the world. And to, to put in up to 20% hydrogen, use it for space heating, for buildings, uh, even for power generation. And the beauty of this is that up to about 20% hydrogen, you can use typically the same furnaces, the same infrastructure uh, valves, et cetera, uh, that you use today. You don't need to change over uh, to a, a different types of uh, valve ports or burner tips, etc. Uh, this represents 20% hydrogen by volume, represents about 7% uh, by energy content. However, there's a number of places around the world, and the UK is a real leader in this, that are looking at taking hydrogen, pure hydrogen, and converting it as a heating fuel. And this race you're going to require, we're going to require new equipment being provided and changing out at least burner tips and maybe uh, turbine designs, new turbine designs for power generation, where pure hydrogen can be used for generating electricity or for heating homes, et cetera, and for other heat applications. In the second possibility are, uh, is for the hydrogen to be brought to fueling stations in order to support transportation needs. And I've talked before about this. This one seems to have more economic viability in the next few years, uh, but especially targeting heavier vehicles uh, trains, buses, trucks, etc., and some off-road vehicles, and even ships and planes. Now, there's three ways that are basically looked at here. One is through hydrogen pipelines. The hydrogen can um, be delivered to the fueling station. Another is by compressing the hydrogen, putting it into a tube truck. And the third, by putting uh, the hydrogen into a cryofaction process, uh, where you basically drop the temperature uh, to about 252, 253 degrees below zero, and uh, it turns into a liquid, and then it can be trucked around uh, to a fueling station for providing the fuel. We're going to look at some of the economics of these processes. And then there's a possibility of taking either liquid hydrogen or converting the hydrogen into ammonia and then exporting it as an export product uh, for, um, for other export markets. Approximately today, Canada exports more than 50% of the energy that we extract from the fossil energy taken from Mother Nature, if you like. And we export more than 50, but almost 60% of it today. Uh, and the rest of it is, is used domestically. And, uh, and so in the, in the future, we could be seeing um, net zero emission fuels uh, being exported, uh, perhaps as an alternative, maybe in addition to initially, and then as an alternative to carbon-based fuels as we move to a net zero energy systems around the world. So let's, I want to go through each of those areas in this value chain and, and talk about some of the economics of it, the way we are looking at it within Canada, and what how it's actually um, affecting the strategy that Canada is using and that we're using within Alberta uh, to develop a, a vibrant uh, hydrogen economy that can uh, be economically viable with ongoing public subsidies. And I think it's important to recognize the importance in both green and blue hydrogen of, 
of the cost of electricity in driving the real cost of, hyd of green hydrogen uh, and the cost of natural gas driving the cost of, of blue hydrogen. But there are other factors that are important as well, because you can sometimes get low cost electricity in the middle of the night, but not during all the all day. You can get down to maybe $20 a megawatt hour or $30 a megawatt hour uh, when there's uh, supply over, you know, is more than what demand is. Uh, and in which case you can get to lower cost um, um, uh, hydrogen production, but your electrolyzer is only being used a small proportion of the time, and electrolyzers are expensive today. Uh, it's it, the price typically comes out between three to six dollars per kilogram of hydrogen, but it's expected to reduce by maybe sixty percent, is according to the IEA, within the next ten to fifteen years. And as some some people are arguing that cost of electrolyzers will come down in the next five years uh, by fifty or sixty percent, and uh, we might see this reduction of the green hydrogen cost uh, coming much sooner than was originally thought. In the case of blue hydrogen, um, the bigger the plant to make the hydrogen, you get an efficiency of scale. And uh, certainly we're looking at uh, between 400 to 600, even more tons of hydrogen per day being made in, in the Edmonton region uh, and in many of the announcements that are, being, are in that scale of very large scale hydrogen production. Uh, and the natural gas with natural gas price and a little bit with the scale, you can get a production cost of around $1.40 to $3 per kilogram of hydrogen. And this price is <clears throat> expected to reduce it all as well by, by maybe up to 24% within the next 10 to 15 years, in part with two things happening. One is, is the uh, reduction in the cost of carbon capture and storage as we get uh, uh, more developed and uh, but, you know, probably the technology, this is a mature technology, autothermal reforming or steam methane reforming. So we're probably not going to see a large reduction there. The reduction in green hydrogen is due to the reductions with wind power and solar coming on at lower and lower cost, reduction in the cost of electricity, but also a reduction in the cost of the electrolyzers and an improvement in their efficiency. Now, in the Alberta region, um, the real interest is in the Edmonton region, and this is the capital of Alberta, it's in the north central part of the province of Alberta. Uh, what we have is a, a, a you know, most promising place in Canada to create a new hydrogen value chain. And this is because this part of Alberta, it's in, it has an area called the Alberta Industrial Heartland, and it already has a uh, the pipeline here that carries more or less pure hydrogen, 97, 98% hydrogen or higher. Um, uh, and it's about 55 kilometers long, and it is um, owned by Air Products, and it provides a number of, of plants along that, that pathway. There are refineries, uh, fertilizer plants, etc. Many of these plants also make their own hydrogen, and there's three of them up here in the northern end of the region, which have CO2 pipelines already built. There's the uh, Quest CO2 pipeline. It was put in by Shell a number of years ago, and now is partly owned by Shell and CNRL. And it is taking CO2 made at the Scottford refinery here and pipelines it up to uh, deep saline aquifers uh, just north uh, of Edmonton up here. There's also the uh, Northwest Redwater and a fertilizer plant called Nutrien that makes um, essentially blue ammonia in this case and uh, uh, lower uh, hydrogen here that is used to crack the bitumen and, and refine uh, heavy oils into um, into diesel fuel mostly and the co2 is put into the black line here which is the alberta carbon trunk line and it feeds enhanced oil recovery uh, zones down here in the clive field but it also has the potential to that same pipeline could be used to inject co2 into saline aquifers uh, within this region so there's large potential these Pipelines are only together maybe 10 to 15 percent full. Uh, they've got a lot of exit capacity, and there's a lot of companies that have been announcing recently the desire to switch to blue hydrogen uh, production to uh, in, and put CO2 into one or the other, or perhaps some new pipelines. In fact, in the last four months, we've had four announcements. Uh, in May, Suncor and Atco uh, uh, partnered together and announced a major blue hydrogen facility in the 900 ton per day range 
uh, by 2027. A month later, Air Products came out and announced one in the 800 to 900 ton a day range, in perhaps even more by 2024. Uh, Scottford came out and said that they've got plans to uh, for CO2 infrastructure that would hold 300 million tons of CO2, uh, and, you know, that uh, opening up a capacity to uh, for other people to put CO2 within uh, for within their infrastructure. And of course, Petronas and this group would know very much about this, uh, partnered with the Japanese company to talk about blue hydrogen production and ammonia export in this region. And there's a lot of, of uh, buzz and interest in more details about, uh, about what is planned there. And, and certainly if I can wear my transition accelerator hat, it's a nonprofit, we're interested in helping in any way we can to, to explore different opportunities and move things along. So the strategy when we, we've recently worked with the um, various governments in this region and the companies in this region to set up within the last six months, uh, the Edmonton Regional Hydrogen Hub and the Transition Accelerator, again, it's a nonprofit that is, uh, that I helped to set up two years ago, uh, is now working to basically build out a hydrogen economy in this region. Our proposed strategy is to piggyback on industrial blue hydrogen production and try to target some of that hydrogen be used as fuel hydrogen to create this new hydrogen economy where hydrogen is acting as a fuel or an energy carrier, uh, not just a reductant that is used to uh, reduce other chemicals and as an industrial feedstock. Then we want to identify, of course, new fuel market opportunities in the region. And we want to then connect supply to demand and export export opportunities uh, for these systems. So the obvious place that we've been focusing our attention in the city of Edmonton, it's a city of uh, about a million people in the whole region, just over a million people in this region. Uh, they have, uh, so we've been targeting and analyzing, and I won't have time today to show you a lot of that data, but we can talk about it if you like, but targeting where the main uh, fuel demand would be fuel markets would be in that region, targeting diesel markets, home heating markets, uh, space heating markets, as well as power generation and other industrial markets that uh, that could use hydrogen. Uh, and, and the idea is to try to then get them to work together in a cooperative way to benefit from the synergies that come with, um, with scale. When we've also looked at the emissions intensity of, of hydrogen, uh, the one that we're looking at in here is basically between these two, it's a steam methane, re, re, uh, steam methane um, uh, reforming with a flue gas capture, 90% CCS capture, or the one that's really most of the companies that I just announced and talked about uh, that have announced blue hydrogen projects are looking at autothermal reforming with 95% carbon capture and storage. And uh, so the the darker blue in this zone here is the emissions that come off of the actual making the hydrogen itself. And the upstream emissions of methane are shown uh, as in here. But overall, we're talking around, around two and a half or three uh, kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen, which brings it into a range similar to many of the green hydrogens, a little bit higher than wind, nuclear, and hydro, a little bit less than solar, perhaps, on a life cycle emissions. And certainly a lot less than doing electrolysis with electricity made from natural gas combined cycle gas turbines, which would be well over 20, uh, and uh, and other sorts of electricity. And this, what the one we're looking at here, this is equivalent, if you want it in units that are often used, is about 21 grams of CO2 per megajoule of hydrogen, that's higher heat value for hydrogen. And most of the emissions here are, you can see there, the lighter blue is from methane loss. And there's a lot of discussion, both in Canada and internationally, about putting new regulations to dramatically reduce the amount of methane emissions that come from fossil fuel uh, recovery uh, and distribution, uh, pipelines, et cetera. And uh, we know how to reduce those emissions dramatically. And Canada and the United States are partnering now to put a ruling even by 2025 to reduce by 40 to 45 percent those upstream emissions by 2025. Uh, and I'm, I'm strongly that's going to be important in moving these emissions towards the net zero is to stop the upstream. <clears throat> what I'd like to do now is go to the next part 
of this chart where we're looking at hydrogen going in for use uh, for heat and for power use. And, and a lot of what I've been asked to do in this presentation is talk about the techno economics. So I'm showing you some of the technologies. I'm going to try to provide the economics from a Canadian perspective that, as we look at them. We see the production of this hydrogen from blue hydrogen at about $1.63 approximately. This includes all of my calculations could include 8% return on investments or essentially uh, on this. There's a, an enhanced oil recovery credit. If it was sold into a pipeline, you'd get actually paid to put the CO2 into enhanced oil recovery pipeline. That's worth about 17 cents. So the net cost of blue hydrogen is around $1.50. And uh, compression to the pipeline is going to cost about 20 cents. And then you've got to, you want to pipeline that gas to the gates within the city of Edmonton and the other surrounding cities where it is the pressure drop from the high pressure natural gas to the low pressure natural gas that gets distributed to every house and every building uh, within the city uh, for the heating network. And uh, those gates, there are about 10 of them around the city, and they have distributions. There, all the gates are in industrial corridors, and uh, we've calculated it's about 60 cents uh, per kilogram of hydrogen the cost to uh, to distribute that to the gates. Um, and uh, and it's probably even quite a bit less than that if we actually did it at full scale. This is uh, sort of in the early stages of that deployment. But we see the cost uh, before tax benefits delivered before you get any tax benefit from zero emission carbon, because this doesn't include carbon taxes or anything on it. Those will drive the price up. We're seeing that as about $16 a gigajoule. Um, right now, this gas would sell for, you know, retail price of about 6 or $7 a gigajoule. So this is quite an, uh, a much higher price. But by the time the Canadian government has um, put us in place a policies to increase the carbon price to $170 per ton of CO2 by 2030. So in about starting in about 2024, it goes up by about $15 per ton of CO2 every year unt, um, until it reaches 170 in 2030. Uh, and that at 2030 price, uh, essentially the price would be about $13 per gigajoule um, for uh, you know, for for the natural gas. So obviously this dollar is the dollar economics doesn't work here. We're going to need policies like clean fuel standards are going to be needed to require uh, more and more uh, low carbon fuels going into our, our heating system. And uh, I think uh, Canadians are going to have to expect more to pay more for heat in a net zero future. Uh, and it'll really incentivize people insulating their houses better uh, to keep the uh, uh, heat in in the winter and uh, heat out in the summer, if you like, um, within our with our energy systems. Now let's look at hydrogen as a transportation fuel, where we see hydrogen can be through pipelines, be through tube trucks or liquid hydrogen, and uh, to provide the transportation fuel. So what are the economics of these various value chains uh, for connecting hydrogen to the fueling station? There's a classic paper, Yang and Ogden, Ogden, there's a reference here for it that showed this graph. And this was, uh, it's quite old now. It's probably, you know, 14, 15 years old uh, when the work was done. Uh, but what it showed, and I think the basic principles are the same. These are in US dollars, but it showed that when you have compressed, you can use gaseous hydrogen for fuelings for hydrogen transport when you, um, only have a small amount of hydrogen, relatively small, and for small pilots, et cetera. But the price goes up very quickly with uh, transport distance, and uh, and it also rises as you, as you, you know, it, it just doesn't scale very well. Liquid hydrogen um, is really good for early deployment, but there's a basic floor to the price of liquid hydrogen. What we really need, though, for long-term economic viability is to get a scale of hydrogen use in the many tens of tons per day and especially for longer distances it's important to get even more flow if you like and pipelines are needed to for longer term viability a lot of the work that we've been doing in the edmonton region is to identify where the pipeline corridors should go where are the major large scale demands for that hydrogen 
in order to put a single pipeline in at scale and feed the multiple demands and and make the economics attractive to uh, to the uh, companies that and and the individuals and and companies that are interested in these um, in in using hydrogen and avoiding the carbon taxes etc. And of course the uh, those corridors are often transportation corridors. That's a major use, uh, but industrial corridors through through cities and and countrysides. So when we've been looking at cost estimates, this is in the Edmonton region hydrogen hub. So what are the cost estimates for mature value chains? So we're looking at tube trailer trucking, where we're doing a, we've done detailed techno-economic analysis. This report should come out in about a month or so a month or two months from now, but uh, we're looking at purification, compression, putting it into a terminal, driving the truck in, um, we've got three different distances we're talking about, five kilometers, um, 40 kilometers, and 300 kilometers from the fueling station. And, uh, and the fueling stations are two different sizes, either two tons a day or 10 tons a day. And so what we've done is the blue is the industrial production around $1.63, uh, the, all of the brown area in here is basically the processing and moving the hydrogen and the green are the fueling stations. So when we take all of these and break down all the techno-economics, and I'm, you'll be very happy I'm not going to take you through every one of these. I will show you the final results, though, of this study. And what we can see here is blue, again, is the hydrogen production. It's more or less the same throughout. There's small variations because some of these pathways have more losses in hydrogen than others and uh, so we had to make a little bit more hydrogen uh, in production in order to deliver uh, a kilogram of hydrogen at the end as at the fueling station the brown areas in the middle here on all these are the um, uh, the economics for uh, preparing the hydrogen into a form that can be transported and uh, and getting it to the fueling station and the green is the cost of the fueling station. So the major take home messages I got on the right, for every kilogram of hydrogen, preparing and moving the hydrogen is the most expensive for liquid hydrogen. The liquid hydrogen is obviously the most effective and liquefaction is the main part. There's a liquid hydrogen here. The dark brown, uh, ready brown is the, is the liquefaction piece. And, uh, and it's the most expensive. It's a cost of electricity mostly, but also a fairly significant capital cost on liquefaction. And, uh, and, and the least expensive is the pipeline. And the, but we're moving the pipeline, in this case, fairly small, five kilometer distance. This is 40 kilometers, but we've got a trunk line here. I should have written this on here. I did on the other one, but um, this should have said, it's a hundred uh, tons a day trunk line and within five kilometers of, of off of a 100 ton a day trunk line. And this one is 300 kilometers, but it's on a 300 ton a day trunk line. And we can get, you know, the pricing here is all in the range for all of these, somewhere between $4.50 per kilogram to about $7.50 or $8 a kilogram. So, you know, it's, it's in a range for fuel cost where, um, you know, the, the cheapest here is coming in around $30, $35 a gigajoule, higher heat value to about $55 a gigajoule. And this actually is comparable to the um, uh, the retail price of transportation fuels today. And those prices will go up uh, as the carbon tax uh, rises over the next uh, eight to 10 years. <clears throat> well, the other interesting thing here is the fueling stations are the most expensive with pipelines and the least expensive with liquid hydrogen. And this is mostly the cost of the compression because when the pipeline arrives, it's usually lower pressure. I think we had it arriving at about 20 bars pressure, whereas uh, the tube trailers would be sort of uh, 200 bars or 400 bars. And uh, liquid hydrogen, of course, can uh, you can actually take the liquid hydrogen and, and, uh, and pump it in and, and create your pressure as you gasify it. So one of these things, and of course, the other thing though is bigger stations are better. The 10 ton a day fueling stations and all these pairs has a lower price, significantly lower price than a two ton a day. And we would argue that fueling, one of the reasons that fueling stations 
make a lot more sense for large vehicles, for big trucks, for trains, etc., is you can get fueling stations that you can get enough vehicles that use enough fuel to justify the economics for building a fairly large fueling station. If you're fueling uh, a typical personally owned vehicle, a uh, typical use of a personally owned vehicle is probably about 0.7 kilograms a day per vehicle. Uh, and they'd of course only refuel once every week or so. Um, these vehicles, most of the trucks we're looking at are refueling every day, maybe even twice a day and using perhaps 50 to 80 kilograms per vehicle for the big trucks uh, on Alberta highways. And that means that one truck can create a significant demand at a fueling station and one can get an economically viable fueling station for perhaps 40 or 50 trucks. And, and as you get more and more trucks, the station becomes a real profit center for the value chain. <clears throat> now at scale, um, pipeline delivery is the lowest cost and we see it as really the direction that we need to go if we're trying to build a whole value chain. Because once you have a pipeline, you open up even a pipeline targeting for major uh, heavy vehicle fueling stations, you open up opportunities for putting hydrogen, uh, the lower cost hydrogen. So at this price here, you know, where you're talking under $20 a gigajoule, you have an opportunity to put that hydrogen into space heating or even uh, perhaps some uh, you know, fuel uh, power demand when, uh, when there's a real shortage of electricity and power prices are high. Um, so let's, uh, with, with the other thing we need to look at is the original equipment manufacturers, because that's an also another piece in this value chain that we need to create. And so we're talking about the companies that make the vehicles, of course. There are a number of companies that you probably know already that make hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. We're in discussion with um, all of these and, and some others. Um, these are some of these are available now, like the Toyota Mirai or New Flyer buses. They're hydrogen fuel cell buses. They're available now. Highs on trucks. This is a Singapore company uh, making what is it? Um, um, uh, Horizon fuel cells, I believe, and they're building them into trucks in New York, and uh, they're going to have the trucks on the road by later this year. And we're just negotiating with Hyzon to bring the first one of the early Hyzon trucks by mid 2022. We hope to have it in uh, in a traveling roadshow in Alberta uh, by mid 2022. We've also had a lot of uh, discussions with Nicola, which are talking about their truck being available fourth quarter 2022. And uh, we're looking at having it in Edmonton or in the Alberta region early 2023. And Hyundai, these trucks are running now. They're in a few places around the world. Uh, we haven't been able to secure access to those trucks yet in Alberta, but we hope to very soon. The other possibility is hydrogen diesel dual fuel vehicles. We see these as a very interesting technology to, to help create demand at fueling stations and, uh, and accelerate the uh, growth of fueling station networks. These vehicles are interesting. They put, uh, they get retrofitted with hydrogen injectors on the engine and they put tanks of hydrogen on the vehicle. So these don't generate electricity on the vehicles. There's some companies that do that. These actually have, uh, have enough hydrogen on the vehicle to use about 30 or 40 percent, even 50 percent of the fuel use of the vehicles comes from hydrogen and and the rest of its diesel fuel. And the beauty of this is that the hydrogen improves the combustion of the diesel fuel in the engine and you get vastly reduced particulate emissions. So it helps in the air emissions, right? It also reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 30, 40, 50 percent, depending on how much hydrogen you have in the drive cycle of the vehicle. But the other advantage of it is that if you run out of hydrogen because there's not enough fueling stations, the vehicle just becomes a diesel vehicle again. And so there's not the, it's a much lower risk level for the vehicle operators. So we've been working, we have a project with Cummins uh, to put it, build a hydrogen injection into the, uh, into the um, base engine of the um, uh, ECU, the uh, engine control unit uh, uh, that controls. Uh, Hydra is another company, a Canadian company that is building a, uh, a hydrogen technology. Ulemco is a British uh, UK company that has some vehicles on the road. These two vehicles are, are Ulemco 
and um, uh, and these are uh, th these add, however, about 20 to 50 k premium for every vehicle, depending on. So it's, it's really good if you're using a lot of fuel, and especially if you've got some government cooperation to not charge taxes on the fuel you use for the hydrogen you use, uh, then you can get things to work and and become a total cost of ownership can go down because the engine burns cleaner. Um, fuel cell vehicles are typically today about two to three times the cost of internal combustion engine. And obviously this has to change, but these are being made in ones or twos or maybe a hundred at a time, whereas we we're talking uh, in the internal combustion engines being made thousands at a time. <clears throat> um, so, and tens of thousands, of course. Uh, the prices should come down as the numbers arise and we get into mass production of these vehicles. Uh, and the old, real thing that matters, especially for commercial operators, is of course, is the total cost of ownership. Uh, and uh, what we're going to need, though, are government policies and incentives are going to be needed in the early stages. So what we've been doing in the transition accelerator is putting a, a value chain proposals together to say for government funding to create the these hydrogen hubs. We're going to need to put some money into helping get the price of the OEMs down so it makes it an attractive option for the um, for the uh, companies buying the vehicles and using the vehicles. And then finally, before I stop here, I would like to um, talk a bit about export. Um, this is something, of course, Petronas is is uh, is uh, tried in Canada to export energy from Western Canada. It's been a bit of a frustrating uh, exercise, I suspect, uh, to try to get through with our, the way our provincial system works. We've been looking to look at the potential for hydrogen export, or export of, of low carbon fuels. We sense that there's a, going to be more support for that than uh, perhaps for export of LNG or for export of uh, oil. Uh, at least we hope so, and there's conversations that we're beginning with First Nation groups about this. Um, liquid hydrogen could be exported by train and to a ship and then to extra markets, or convert into ammonia and try train to the west coast. Ammonia pipeline is another option uh, that I think is being talked about by the Petronas project. On the other possibility is bringing hydrogen to uh, to the United States or into other export markets or to other provinces. One of the things that we've been doing some analysis of the just in the early stages of of techno-economics of various transport uh, modes. Uh, ammonia is certainly one of the ones uh, it's better than compressed or liquid hydrogen and, and highly competitive with liquid organic hydrogen carriers um, for large volume, long distance transport. It can be pipelined. Uh, as I know people on this call will know. Uh, one of the problems with that is leaks can be deadly and certainly getting um, uh, First Nations approval for pipelines going across land could be a challenge. One of the things we've been looking at in our analysis is the possibility of pipelining blue hydrogen to the west coast and actually making it on the west coast. And there is even a, you know, you could make the blue hydrogen through um, capturing the CO2, make it through autothermal reforming, sending the blue hydrogen, and then one's going to have to do an air separation and make your, get your nitrogen and, and, and export, send it to export markets. Or the other possibility is to actually send in the pipeline, and we're just modeling this now, it'll be a while before we get it done, but a combination of maybe 67% hydrogen, 33% nitrogen uh, that comes from the autothermal process. And basically, you've got the gas composition you need to make ammonia on the West Coast. And therefore, a leak of the hydrogen might actually be a lot less uh, of a concern. This report came out recently. May, you, many of you may have seen it. came out in July this year, looking at hydrogen carrier economics, mostly for shipping. Uh, and, uh, and again, it confirms that you know ammonia and liquid organic hydrogen carriers have some benefit. But ammonia is a particularly benefit, I would argue, because Japan and other countries um, are looking at burning ammonia as a fuel in, in gas turbines to make electricity and not even converting it back to hydrogen. That ammonia becomes the fuel itself. And that could certainly be a case for, for ammonia as a fuel on ships and as uh, for power generation. So I think there's a, there's a lot of work to be done and I'd be interested in 
uh, any any thoughts from from the the group here in terms of what seems to be um, most interest and uh, what are some of the challenges and opportunities. So in conclusion, in the transition to net zero energy systems, uh, there must be major roles uh, for both low carbon electricity and hydrogen. And as I said before, we see these as, uh, you know, as a, as a hand in glove, essentially they, they work together in order to transition us to low carbon energy systems. Hydrogen production coupled to carbon capture and storage um, is today and I think well into the future going to be a, a lower cost version and it offers the fossil fuel sector an opportunity to play a leadership role in this transition. And Alberta and the Edmonton region are working uh, to help uh, uh, to help to create this new value chain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave, for that. Dave, for that. Thank you, Dave, Thank for you. that informative presentation. Uh, you know, it makes me, makes me wish we had more professors like you when I was in college uh, studying engineering. <laughs> uh, and, and we can tell that it was an interesting, uh, interesting uh, uh, presentation that it, uh, our, pres our audience found value in it because uh, we see a lot of questions in the uh, chat box and we'll try to get through uh, as many of them as, as we can. So ladies and gentlemen, now that we've heard from Dave, we would like to, to hear from you. So uh, we already have a few questions in, in the chat box and we will try to get through as many of them as we can. But uh, perhaps we'll, since we are, we are running short in time, uh, I'll, I'll go through a couple of the questions first. Uh, and it does seem, Dave, that there are some questions about the, environment, the environmental impact of hydrogen as a fuel. So uh, one such question that, that we see is uh, uh, Raghunath Bharat asks, you know, uh, if, when hydrogen is used for combustion, it produces H2O. Uh, what would be the environmental impact of, of this large production of, of uh, H2O? Very little. I mean, the, when you put water into the atmosphere, it has a half-life in the atmosphere of about two weeks. And so, whereas carbon dioxide has a half-life of 110 years, right? So, you know, basically, you know, certainly water is a greenhouse gas, but it rains. Uh, unfortunately, CO2 doesn't rain out. So, um, so basically, they're really short, even though it's a, a greenhouse gas, it just comes out of the atmosphere when it rains. So it's, uh, you've, they've calculated the global warming potential of water. There's a wonderful publication in there. I can send them, somebody sends you an email. Uh, it's about point, uh, if it's 1.0 for carbon dioxide, I think it's 0 0.016 for water. It's almost zero, right? No global warming potential. Thanks, uh, We also have uh, another question which references uh, a study that came out of uh, Cornell University a couple of weeks ago, uh, which, which basically says that uh, blue hydrogen is actually worse than natural gas when it comes to uh, carbon footprint. Uh, what are your comments on these? No, I think I've certainly seen that study. I've spent quite a bit of time reading through it. and I've had some of my uh, engineers and my team deconstruct it. I think what they described, if you uh, you know, they've described a system all the worst possible ways. If you really wanted to make uh, a hydrogen with the largest carbon footprint, they described that tech, that way of doing it. I would argue that we, all of our analysis and working with the various companies, we can make hydrogen with a much lower carbon footprint than what they're talking about. They also talk about a um, a three and a half percent leak rate of hydrogen. But that's kind of a three and a half percent for the oil and gas sector. And if you look at a recent paper in Nature that just came out about two weeks ago, um, most of the extra high, um, methane emissions is not actually coming from the natural gas sector. It's coming from large containers of oil that are in storage, storage oil. And, um, and so the fugitive emissions, I mean, we have to control our fugitive emissions and policy and regulations have got to reduce fugitive emissions. I would disagree that you would assign a three and a half percent leak rate to natural gas emissions. And we're in the process of trying to follow through with other data to get what would be a more reasonable uh, numbers for, for the, the process. My sense though is that I, what I agree with the study for sure is we have to look at life cycle emissions. And the the wild card, as I mentioned in this, my presentation, 
the wild card on on hydrogen, blue hydrogen production is the upstream methane emissions. And we are going to need as a society, as industry, to um, reduce those emissions, uh, to, to be much more careful about what is vented. Yeah, and uh, you, you mentioned earlier, Dave, uh, about the, the policy component as well, which is which is an important part of, of uh, rolling out uh, hydrogen as a fuel. So, uh, and that is one of the, the issues. In fact, it's part of the reason where we're having this, this session today, having this discussion with you is uh, that as Malaysia works towards developing its own hydrogen uh, economy, as uh, Malaysia is venturing into hydrogen technology, uh, there's, still, uh, there's still work being done on developing a hydrogen policy or developing a hydrogen roadmap for, for Malaysia. So we have a question here from uh, Rosman Hamza who, uh, who asked this question. It says, uh, for a country like Malaysia, what would be the, the initial step for uh, a country like Malaysia to, to get started on this hydrogen journey? Should Malaysia should first focus on producing hydrogen for export or should it focus more on uh, pr domestic production and consumption for to to bolster the the local economy what what would be the the uh, the, the first step towards uh, making that transition towards hydrogen my guess is that I don't much about the Malaysian um, energy system but my sense is that in the early stages you probably make a lot of hydrogen now for your refineries uh, and you know you're already making hydrogen. You might want to look at what the potential is to capture the CO2 and sequester that to make some blue hydrogen that is used for industrial. That gets you to scale. It's um, if you once you get to that, then look for nearby markets for that hydrogen that are domestic markets. I think that's a good learning curve to understand about you know the product you got. It also gives you credibility. But I think if um, if, if you can produce blue hydrogen, low carbon blue hydrogen, uh, I think it makes sense to look at the export markets. So I, I would say it's first, second, third. First, I'd say figure out how to make blue hydrogen domestically, where you're going to store your CO2, because that's going to be your big factor. You are uh, much better sun conditions than Canada, I might say. So I think green hydrogen is probably a significant potential for your for your, your country. Um, and uh, and, and I think, you know, wind power is probably some other opportunities for you. But so I think looking at where you produce the hydrogen, but then try to find low cost. Uh, and municipalities uh, or governments that have fleets of vehicles or, uh, or even the oil companies themselves uh, could start to convert some of their heavy vehicles um, to, to hydrogen as a way of a learning curve, but also a demonstration. And, uh, but I would say certainly look out for the uh, domestic uh, world markets. Uh, Japan and South Korea uh, are certainly out there in the marketplace looking for, uh, and you know, I think uh, Canada needs a little competition in trying to, Australia as well, in you know, kind <laughs> of markets. Uh, well, well said. And, and I think one of the, the challenges with, uh, with hydrogen or one of the, the teething problems uh, we see with, with hydrogen uh, or the, the economics of it uh, is really accessing lower cost electricity. So uh, we have a question from Nick Hoskins who asks, uh, do you believe, Dave, that uh, national or, or provincial electricity companies need to provide better behind the meter subsidized electricity to support the growth of, of green hydrogen? I think that's a short-term solution to a long-term problem. I think there needs to be, as you, as Malaysia thinks about transitioning to a, a you know, a low-carbon economy, you know, probably look at taxes and carbon taxes and try to incentivize shifting more and more of your energy demand to electricity, but electricity that is made without carbon emissions, wind and solar, possibly nuclear, but uh, you know the other sorts of, of, of electricity sources. Um, but the one thing about those sources is, is you can't always um, match supply and demand. And that opens up a really interesting opportunity for hydrogen production. Because when, as you try to solve, and we've been doing a lot of computer models on this, as we try to build 
low carbon electricity for Canadian uh, provinces uh, with renewables, that's the lowest cost electricity around is from the renewables. What we find is that it really becomes a problem if you sometimes generate too much electricity and doesn't meet demand. And that's an opportunity to put in electrolyzers because you're essentially your electricity is virtually free and you can then you can actually make the hydrogen and you actually you, you start serving two energy systems. I think when we look at energy systems of the future, they won't be thinking about an oil company making transportation fuels, a gas company making heating fuels, and a company's making electricity. They'll be energy companies. And what they'll be doing is triaging between the various types of energy and the various energy markets. And those ones are going to have more economic viability and more resilience in this uh, transition to a net zero future. We have some questions here as well about the uh, safety component of, of uh, hydrogen. So uh, we have uh, Fern Raja Harris who asks, uh, we, we know how that hydrogen is an explosive gas. What are the biggest leaps in technology that we've seen that, that ensure that the hydrogen supply chain is safe uh, at every step of the value chain? Well, I think we've learned a lot since 1928 when the Hindenburg <laughs> went to, um, there's been a lot of advances and we have all of our fuels, our energy carriers are dangerous, right? Gasoline, diesel. Uh, I would argue that um, hydrogen is, it's got its own specific challenges as a gas. But one of the good things, if there is a leak, it diffuses very quickly. Uh, and it's probably, and if it's, if there's a leak in a gasoline or a diesel car, it goes underneath and if it catches fire, uh, you know, the vehicle's on fire, right? Whereas hydrogen will be a torch. It will, uh, if it catches fire, it'll be a, a, a like a torch going off with the high pressure. So the, I would argue that the, um, we know how to manage uh, dangerous gases. We have rules and regulations. I think we have to um, have more training. We've got to have training in our colleges and universities to train people to know, to learn the rules about handling hydrogen, but you know we have the technologies to do it, and um, you know I think that it's I, I'm probably you know you think about it now, if you think if somebody tried to introduce gasoline and diesel today, and you say okay we're going to put a pump there and you're going to just you can pull the pump off and you put your credit card up and then you pull the lever and it squirts the gas out oh oh yeah you got to put it I mean they would never you would never get gas pumps today approved right <laughs> yeah Just, horses are much safer <laughs> that's right oh well, they'd kick you but that's uh, <laughs> uh, so we'll, we'll perhaps take one more one more question here so uh ahmad Suleiman asks you know when when hydrogen fuel reaches the, the consumer what would be the retail unit used for for the sale of hydrogen would it be dollars per, per kilogram of hydrogen or would it be gigajoules per higher heating value of hydrogen? What uh, what do you think would be the the units for uh, the hydrogen trade? That's a good question. I suspect it's it's probably they'll probably buy it in kilograms of hydrogen, the way we buy liters of gasoline. It'll be sold as a weight rather than a volume. Or but you know some uh, jurisdictions sell natural gas as a gigajoule. And some jurisdictions in Canada sell natural gas as a cubic meter, right? And so, you know, some of them do it by volume, some of them do it by energy. And, you know, it, my guess is it'll probably be kilograms. That's the way people are talking about it today, not as gigajoules. And um, so you'll buy a kilogram and you get a lot of, a kilogram of energy has a lot of, it's a very light gas, a lot of energy in a kilogram, right? Um, so, but it takes a lot of, a volume uh, to make up a kilogram. Uh, thank you, David. And, and perhaps one one last uh, question, or perhaps a, a comment from from you. So, and then we re referenced this earlier as well. So, as as Malaysia you know, embarks on its own journey towards uh, the transition, uh, as it embarks on its own uh, developing its own policies around hydrogen, uh, as someone who's worked with the government of Canada to develop Canada's hydrogen strategy. Uh, what would you say are the, the key important points to, to be taken into consideration as Malaysia starts to develop its own policy? Um, 
I think probably the most important thing is um, go big or go home. Uh, you know, it's uh, hydrogen doesn't work well small, right? It's you've got to get to scale. And one of the reasons is the country, the companies in Malaysia that are already making hydrogen today and using it as an industrial feedstock, uh, they understand the importance of scale. They understand the economics of doing things uh, and looking at the markets. Uh, I suspect the, you know, the, the identifying your local markets. In Canada, when we've looked at developing a hydrogen strategy in Canada, it's very clear that when we think about Toronto or in Hamilton region, we think about Quebec and Montreal, when we think about uh, Calgary or Edmonton or Fort McMurray, all of them are totally different in how we design it. So it's, um, it's think regionally, but try to get to scale quickly, right? Because, you know, you've, you can't rely on government subsidies to carry their own way. You've got to make an economically viable system. And when your government's going to need to put some money in to get it started, but it's uh, one needs to move fast enough to get to a critical mass where it's economically viable without subsidies. Excellent. And and on that note, uh, I think we'll wrap up the, the Q&A session. There's still a lot more questions, Dave, in, in the chat box. Some of them have gotten uh, technical. Uh, and so perhaps uh, would you be uh, would you be open to sharing your your presentation deck from from today? Uh, yeah. And and I noticed that I might be able to answer a few of them by email if you like. So um, much appreciated. Thank you once again, Dave, for uh, you know, being with us today for for uh, sharing uh, your insights on the techno economics of hydrogen. And thank you to our audience for such such great great questions today. Uh, to conclude our workshop. I'd like to invite the Senior Trade Commissioner of Canada and Malaysia, uh, Mr. Ryan Berg, to deliver some closing remarks. Ryan, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mohan. So you'll see the picture he shared. I, I look quite different. I, I, I swear it is the same person you see here. That's a that's a younger younger me, and uh, you know before COVID, maybe when uh, I haven't been locked up and grew this long beard. But uh, <laughs> in any case, just uh, uh, I'll just say, uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, Salamat pagi, uh, bonjour. Um, as Mohan said, I'm uh, I'm Ryan Berg. I'm the Senior Trade Commissioner um, at the High Commission of Canada in uh, in Malaysia. Um, just as of a couple days, actually. So I'm uh, I'm new on the ground. I just arrived, and it's a real pleasure for me to be here with you um, uh, this morning as really my first first uh, first um, responsibility or first job uh, in, in my new role. So thank you very uh, very much for having me. Um, again, a big. Uh, I'll try not. I'll try to be quick. I know uh, uh, it's evening for for David as well, um, and uh, and and my colleague Mohan has. Uh, has um, I think uh, uh, thanked a lot of folks, but I'd be remiss if I didn't again thank uh, um, you know Dr. David Lazal for being with us here in his evening in Canada, um, as he's away from his home in another part of Canada right now as well. We've learned, um, so thank you for joining us for your evening. Um, as Mohan has mentioned, he's a, you know a really a, a leading expert in Canada, so we're, we're really fortunate to be able to have had him uh, join us here today uh, and share his thoughts. Uh, he's 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 done a lot of work and put a lot of thought into um, um, uh, into this subject. And so we're, we're, we're thankful to have him. I'd also like to thank um, our collaborators um, uh, on, the, on, on the session. So, uh, you know, Moxie, uh, particularly the president, Ms. Uh, Ms. Sharifa, who joined us this morning and opened the session. Thank you very much. I hope to be able to meet you in person sometime uh, soon. Thank you for your organization and the collaboration that you've had with uh, the Canadian High Commission and, and in general, the you know, in Canada, on the in the oil and gas sector, um, uh, and then in particular as well, uh, Mr. Almran, who uh, who is uh, with us as well, and who is the chair of the Alternative Energy Working Group of uh, of Moxi. So there he is. Thank you very much, Amran. I hope we do have a chance to, to meet as well. Thanks for all of your support and your work on this. Uh, it's uh, it's much uh, appreciated, uh, Mr. Amran. I believe is from uh, CCAP Technical Services uh, uh, as well. So thank you very much. Uh, and a quick uh, thank you to my team, uh, led by Moham uh, in this uh, sector, of course.
course, and um, and our colleague Akmal, who helped put together the session as well, and uh, and Tom. I, I I believe Tom is with us. Tom has uh, has 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 carried the load before I uh, arrived here in terms of the trade program for the uh, High Commission, uh, and so a big thank you to to him for for helping me get uh, get uh, uh, my feet under me as well. Um, so as I mentioned, we've been working with Moxie. Uh, my understanding for for several years several years now. So we appreciate that collaboration, and we look forward to 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 keeping that going over the coming uh, uh, months and years as I take up my new role at the High Commission here as well. Um, the collaboration here in the with the Alternative Energy Working Group in particular, of which uh, my colleague Mohan uh, now plays a, a more formal part, I think, as the vice chairman of that group. Uh, we look forward to that uh, that as well. Uh, we're all very well that we uh, very uh, well aware that we need um, you know we need more uh, we need more energy. Um, uh, it's it's very much tied to the quality of life, and when I say that, I say that that beyond the the normal you know first high level thing you hear from politicians, which is jobs, you know more jobs, more jobs, more jobs. That's clear. Uh, that's a very important part of. Uh, of, of the equation for us in Canada and here here as well, but of course it it it, um, it supports and feeds much more than just that the basic jobs. It funds our quality of life uh, in so many so many as aspects. You know our health uh, sector, our education, uh, and just our general life life lifestyle. Canadians know this. We you know admittedly use more um, energy per house than most other developed develop nations. Um, you know, the frigid winters cause us to heat our hot our homes, but we also play ice hockey in the summer. So we we use a, a, a lot of energy. Uh, Malaysians and uh, know that as well. Um, uh, you know, the, the growth and the usage of energy in the overall Asia Pacific region has been nothing short of, you know, um, uh, of, of remarkable over the last several decades. I think the statistic that we that I heard is a 12 fold increase since about 1965, given the overall growth of this region. Um, so again, it's funding our, our, our um, improving quality of life and our economic development across the world. Uh, so our focus now is more so how do we be more creative? How do we be more creative and how we be and how can we be more responsible with uh, with our energy? So this discussion today is is uh, fantastic and another piece in that uh, in that discussion and our collaboration between our countries. Canada is the fourth largest um, you know, producer of oil and the four, uh, globally and the fourth largest producer of gas. And uh, in Canada, uh, you know, the footprint that we've put together, the strategy that, you know, David has been working on as well and that we've heard about is that, you know, Canada envisions by 2050 that about 30 percent of our end use energies, uh, you know, can hopefully be delivered through hydrogen. Um, so this, um, uh, you know, this hydrogen strategy that has been mentioned for Canada, um, it highlights really the government of Canada's efforts to um, uh, to push us towards and develop a, a vibrant hydrogen hydrogen economy in the future. So we do look forward to that. Um, I know that Malaysia is also developing a roadmap. And so our, our wish here is that we can continue to be collaborators and partners on that development as we, um, you know, together move uh, uh, along this path and this important uh, journey. So with that, I just uh, I hope very much that uh, everyone has enjoyed the sessions uh, with the, the number of questions. And I believe, as Mohan said, more questions in the, in the chat still. It, it, it sounds like people were interested and have a lot of questions. So that's wonderful to see the, the, the large participation here today. Uh, I look forward to getting to know more of you in my time in uh, in in, uh, in Malaysia. Uh, and again, I just thank you very much for participating today for our, our, our speakers and our partners in particular in Moxie. So thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Um, et terima kasih. Well said, Ryan. And uh, on, on that note, no, it, it wouldn't be a, a Moxie event if we did not conclude with, uh, with, a, with a photo session. So uh, we'll invite all our participants today to, to come on camera. Uh, for a group photo, this this is what substitutes for for uh, group photographs nowadays. Since we can't meet in person, it's the it's the next best thing. So, uh, everyone, please uh, who would like to come on screen, please uh, turn on your your cameras, and uh, the secretariat will will take a uh, will take a group photo of everyone here. Raimi, whenever you're ready. All right, ready, everyone. Okay, hydrogen. <laughs> All right, smile. One, two, three. Another one. Good sign. <laughs> Peace. 
three. All right. I think one year of COVID has made us very good at this. <laughs> I remember being very uncomfortable or not used to actually doing this, you know, because we are used to physical presence. Now it's like, okay, you know, it's, it's fine. <laughs> oh, so what we call the new normal. It's new more normal, than, definitely. <laughs> more than one year of COVID. Yes, more than one year, exactly. And I think that presentation, I think I've seen in the chat, everybody really appreciates that presentation, Dave, Dr. Uh, Dr. Lizal. Um, and uh, thank you, Mohan, again, and uh, Ryan for, for having this presentation. Um, I, I think that's that's really fantastic. It's really eye-opener. True, and uh, for sure, so sorry, Dave, please go ahead. No, I just said thank you so much. It's been a delight. I Keep safe, everyone. <laughs> right, uh, and on, on that note, we look forward to, to more opportunities to engage with all of you on this topic. So uh, all of you in the audience today, please stay tuned. There are more upcoming events by MOXIE and by the MOXIE Alternative Energy Working Group, as well as by our team at the High Commission of, of Canada. So please uh, uh, do stay in touch, follow us on social media. And there is a survey link at, which you will see on screen right now. So. Uh, if you would like access to, to the slides today, please fill in the, the survey and you will be able to download the presentation deck. All right. Uh, it's been a pleasure spending this uh, Tuesday morning with all of you. Uh, and uh, for Dave, it's, it's Monday evening. Uh, until we meet again, thank you. Merci beaucoup. Terima kasih. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank please you. Please fill up the survey to get thank your you presentation. Much. Oh, most definitely. Thank you. Bye. Oh, Mohan, that was that was great. I, that was a really good presentation. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Pan. I was very encouraged to see the uh, the the engagement in the in the chat box. Banyak mm. soalan. And and I think um, I think it was too short, lah. Basically, I think I think if we had actually extended that a little bit, then you would have more questions, more interesting mm. pertinent questions, especially after Adlan's presentation uh, last few weeks uh, and and the intent of Petronas to actually go on certain directions. I think. Uh, because Canada is already leading that path in that sense from the representation here. Now, I, I don't know whether um, Juliana is here from Austria, but, you know, <laughs> but, but, you know, I mean, from the presentation that we have, uh, yeah. you know, th th we can actually draw parallel from the experiences that you've had. And I think the very good questions in the in the chat box on this also. Um, it's very interesting, very informative. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, and and uh, once again, I think no, Ryan, Ryan has said this as well. Uh, no. Thank you very much to, to Moxie for uh, working with us on this. Uh, and then and, uh, you know, it, it's good to be on the Alternative Energy Working Group. And uh, I think we will continue to have more of these, these sessions. Uh, you know, and whenever we can get a, a speaker from Canada to, to speak on more other forms of alternative energy, we'll be definitely glad to do so as well. Well, what 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 would be good, well, Mohan, is actually to actually um, materialize materialize this with a potential business opportunity in terms of collaboration. That would be uh, also something, and at least something that we can actually materialize. That would be quite interesting for our members to actually also look forward to uh, something. You know, because of the, the 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 you know, Canada is already leading the way. Malaysia is a little bit you know behind, and not necessarily the same. But you know, what 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 are the business opportunities that we can draw on? parallel to support and actually materialize and commercialize. Cool. Uh, I think that would be something that uh, our members will be looking at also. Sure. And, and I think when a lot of that, we'll start to see more of that when when the borders reopen again, when uh, when more of these Canadian companies can can travel to Malaysia, when more of these Malaysian companies can, can travel to Canada. I think uh, we will start to see a lot of that uh, business opportunities start to, to materialize. Tapi, I think what what Masini is just the the engagement we we can have is right now through through these events. Uh, but hopefully, in in the the months to come by next year, we will we'll have more of these engagement. And uh, already that that uh, that that starting point is already there. We see Petronas is already uh, keen to to develop a, a blue hydrogen blue ammonia project in in Canada. So I, I think we can expect to see a lot more activity from from there.
and, and also as Fatlan say, uh, in Bakun and also uh, Kenya, uh, you know, that, that's Betul. also something that they're piloting, piloting, I think, if I'm mistaken. So mm. that's very interesting. It's already moving. And, you know, uh, if you are at the start, then the, the chances of being there when and ready to actually capture this opportunity is, is, is better in that sense. Betul. Yeah. And I think uh, I wanted to throw in some of the uh, thing that we had in our chat groups. Uh, perhaps, you know, uh, Mohan, Canada can sponsor a group of people from Moxie to actually go and visit all this in Canada. And we'll have a lucky draw or some, some competition to see who is selected. All expenses paid. Thank you, Mohan. Okay, you, I've caught, caught you on, on, on the video. Agree to this. You can never get a sharing and do one. You got your proof with that. Thanks, Mohan. Thanks, Amran. Fantastic. It was great. And uh, thank you, Pon. And I think we'll continue the conversation in, in the, the WhatsApp group. It's good to yeah. see we had 100 and 165 people registered today. And I think we saw about uh, 75 uh, attended. Uh, so I think the uh, conversion it's numbers were. It's more than that. It's about more than that. Mm. Okay. Well, so we have another event coming up next month, uh, Hydrogen juga dengan uh, UTM. So that one uh, will also be a, an interesting one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for attending. See you next time. See you on Friday, actually. Please do come on Friday. I actually um, posted an interesting question to Encik Bacho on yesterday. Um, on the, the the procurement and the uh, licensing uh, tweaking that we, whether they are doing that um, and and Chek Bacho sort of said that he may have an answer on Friday. That's at the Marine Logistics Working Group um, session webinar that will be on Friday. So do come to that also and listen in. Chek Bacho is also going to be one of the speakers. Okay, guys, thank you very much. See you later. Bye. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.